Hello and welcome to Blytheway Business News, where today I'm joined by Robin Young, who is Chief Executive of Amour Minerals Corporation. Amour is listed in London on the A market with the ticker of AMC and a market capitalization of around £26 million. The company operates in uh, Eastern Russia, we'll hear more about that, where it's developing assets in nickel and copper. Um, Robin, welcome back on the program. You're joining us after a busy few weeks for Amur and your, let me get this pronunciation right, the Kuhn Marni project. Um, the news flow began with the mineral resource update for the project, and that's a considerable increase has been reported. Can you explain for us, first of all, why the mineral resource update was conducted and give us a bit more detail on what you found? Okay, thanks, Tim, I appreciate it. Um, we compiled an updated JORC resource estimate that's been independently compiled by RPM out of Australia and China. And the reason for the update was that the drilling had identified that we didn't have four deposits, but we only had three because two of them linked up. And these provided a substantial increase in the resource itself. And we also had done a lot of infill drilling, which converted indicated resource to measured and some of the inferred to indicated. And what's important about those two is that the measured and the indicated are use, usable in the determination of mining reserves. Um, now, last month, you also announced that the TEO, the TEO, have been submitted to the Russian government. Now, many of, of, of Blytheway's viewers, listeners, might not be fully conversant with uh, Russian mining legislation. So, can you explain, I understand the TO moves you one step closer uh, to an approved mine plan, but just tell us what the TO is, how does it fit in, and what does it now mean for the development of the project? A TO is, is actually a feasibility study. This document is compiled by an independent Russian company that's certified in, such, in the assembly of these kinds of documents. The document itself is then forwarded on to what well, the GKZ. Now the GKZ compiles reserves and they're the only institute inside of Russia that is allowed to uh, certify and, and let you quote uh, the reserves in accordance with Russian protocols. Um, it, it roughly matches um, a JORC estimate in that they compile uh, reserves categories of B, C1, and C2. B is approximately measured. C1 is approximately indicated. Um, these are practices that have, these, these classifications have been utilized since uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, broke up. Th that organization still remains in place. With that certified number from the GKZ, you can then compile a detailed mine plan and move ahead with uh, bankable uh, feasibility study compilations. This is an important document. Um, one of the things that they do is, is, is that they use a minimum 25 year mine life. And we in our PFS had used a, a mine life of 15 years. There are substantial differences between the tail and the PFS that was issued in February of 2019. Um, primarily, we now have added in the, the uh, ability to mark, to generate, market, and sell a copper concentrate, not previously available to the PFS. We have also added in the, the construction of a full power line and a full two lane wide road. The reason for the inclusion of these parameters is it allows the Russian government to establish the largest possible reserve that it can certify so that you don't have to revisit it every three or four years. So the TEO is, is a key document and is a mandatory document which allows us to feed through into, into the development of a mine plan and ultimate bankable feasibility study. Um, so those that's where we stand today. And the process is, is underway at this point, where it's a team of Russian professionals by sector that evaluate the potential and any concerns and considerations that have to be addressed before final certification by the GKZ. Okay, so you're making good progress 
uh, towards getting the uh, the operation um, into production, I guess. Now, it looks as though when you do get to production, that's going to quite nicely coincide with a global shortage of supplies and those key battery metals, you know, nickel, cobalt. You know, how important do you think that your asset, Kunmani, how important is that deposit going to be for, let's call it, the Green Revolution? Um, it's it's a critical uh, deposit, as are all other nickel sulfide deposits. Um, uh, looking forward, the development of Kunmani will fall in the cycle uh, where there's an anticipated substantial nickel shortage for key battery metals. Uh, in particular, if we address nickel, um, there's about 2.2 million tons per annum required for use in all in all products, such as including iron ore, or excuse me, uh, stainless steel and steel production. Um, the EV consumption component right now in a car is about 40 kilograms per ton. Um, if you took 100% of our measured and indicated resource that we've got defined and we're able to put it through a plant and recover it out the back of the plant, including metallurgical losses, um, that means we would be able to produce about 17.5 million batteries. Um, in 2030, um, Deloitte projects that we're going to need 21 million EV units per annum. Um, we don't even fill in the, the void for a single year. So we need to find more Kunmani eggs than, than are presently defined in the, the nickel resource industry today. So if you do an extrapolation, uh, there's not enough nickel sulfide deposits uh, identified to meet the green needs of the world. So especially knowing that, that uh, it takes a minimum of 10 to 15 years to discover and place a project into production. And that's on a, uh, that's on a, a quick uh, cycle basis. But let's be honest, the, that kind of demand for nickel and others can only be good news for, for Amur and, and other producers of nickel. It's got to be, got to be good news for you and your shareholders. Um, yes, uh, we believe so. And one of the key elements in, in the work that we've been doing at this point in time is that we've only been using a $6 a pound nickel price when today's price is actually $8.85 a pound. So we've gone with the far more conservative basis. The, the copper price that we've utilized is $2.70 a pound, where it's running at $4.45 at this point in time. So we do see a lot of uh, uh, upside potential in this. We've tried to stay as conservative as we can so that we can develop a project that will actually take us through the generation and sale of a concentrate. And we're also taking a look at downline potential where we advance our product from a concentrate towards that of, of say a sulfate product, which would actually push us into the realm of generating higher revenues because sulfate at present is, to, is demanding a premium over nickel briquettes. Thanks for that. Now, you're out there, as I said, at the start of the program in uh, the far Eastern part of Russia. Uh, there's been a lot of corporate activity out there, mergers, acquisitions. I mean, what, what's your view on that, Robin? Um, yes, I think that uh, a good part of it is the infrastructure support that's coming out of the Russian Federation. Um, there are multiple agencies, the Far East Development Funds, that that are providing support for infrastructure development along the lines of, of road and power. Now, in particular, the most recent uh, project that has been completed was the construction and completion of a rail bridge um, across the Amur River, which allows for direct transport of commodities into China. Um, that substantially shortens our rail haulage internal Russia from, from uh, uh, Vladivostok, which is nearly uh, 1,700 kilometers away to less than 750. These are the kinds of things that, are, that are, are seem to be pushing uh, a lot of activities in the Russian Far East. Um, one of the things is, is that on a, on a global basis, what we're seeing is that, that almost all nickel expiration, including the sulfide nickel, is being done by juniors. And, and we're the ones that have identified the EV type products uh, that will be utilized. Um, so what we're seeing is that, that, that moving forward, there will be a trend for the majors to start picking up the, the juniors that have developed all this nickel, especially in light of the fact that 
we're looking at such shortages uh, occurring by the year, say 2030, even 2025. Um, are there activities going out in our region? Yes, um, we, we've seen, seen companies, uh, probably one of the most recent ones that are, well, that are known by our investors is the, the sale of Malmish to Russian copper from a Canadian junior company. So those activities are out there, they're available, and it's a matter of us just continuing to advance the project and watch and listen and talk to as many people as we always have. Finally, Robin, before I let you go, it seems odd to be saying it, but we're already looking at the, the last quarter of the, the year. Um, what can we expect from a more by way of news flow between now and uh, the end of 2021? Well, we're looking at a series of TAO updates and comparisons to the to the, the previous PFS so that everybody can develop a full understanding as to the full impact of the TAO and its use in developing a mine plan. Uh, a lot of the work in the TAO can be pushed forward into the bankable feasibility study. And we have to bear in mind that we are working under Russian regulatory standards. So we'll be meeting, we'll be, be maintaining compliance with the Russian government, as well as compiling a document that could be suitable for, for Western financing. Uh, once these reserves are certified and we have the mine plan in hand, detailed engineering designs for the bankable study um, can proceed with, with foresight of a solid concrete target. Um, one of the things that we need to do, including in this, in, included in this BFS going forward, is the evaluation of downstream flow sheet potential. You know, what can we do with the concentrate that's generated? Specifically, can we establish that we can generate a precursor product that's uh, near the, for immediate use in the inclusion of EV batteries? Um, so that means we would end up taking a look at generating a nickel sulfate product, which would yield a premium to, to the market, especially to nickel briquettes at this point in time. Um, this obviously has the key benefits of, of opening the door to a far greater number of precursor product purchasers. And this would include EV battery manufacturers, EV car manufacturers. So there's a substantial uh, increase in our, avail um, in our ability and, and target market for sale of nickel product. Well, Robin, you must come back and keep us updated on progress. Uh, that was Robin Young, Chief Executive of Amur Minerals. As I said, Amur is listed in London on the AIM market. Uh, AMC is the ticker. Uh, updating is on the progress with his nickel and copper assets in Russia and uh, possibly bringing those into production just as we get to the point where the EV market really takes off. That's it from Blindway Business News for this edition. Thanks for watching.